as we uh, kind of, we're returning to Matthew 16, but um, it actually works out really well because people are thinking about New Year and all that and resolutions and blah, blah, blah that nobody ever keeps. But we also kind of think about our walk with Christ and what does it mean to follow him. So if you have thought, you know what, I think this year I'd like to, I'd like to ramp up my spiritual life or I'd like to walk close with Jesus, something along those lines. This is actually a great uh, verse to look at, and so that's why we're looking at it today. Um, let me, I do want to open something in prayer, though, and then we'll kind of recap the first part of chapter 16 and then get to the, the crux of the day. But let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for the day. We thank you for your servant, Matthew, who recorded uh, what you did uh, and what your son did um, here and how he taught us. Lord, we know that we need your Holy Spirit to continue teaching us, and so we ask him to open our eyes and our ears for what you have for us today. And as we look at um, this coming year, we, we ask you to, uh, to show us the opportunities that are, uh, that are wide open for us if we are just willing to follow you and take those opportunities. So, Lord, we just pray uh, for you to speak to us and teach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, again, we're looking at 16. The first part of the chapter, just to kind of get get our heads around it because it's been a little bit since we've been in Matthew. Um, you have the Pharisees and Sadducees come, and they're, they're testing Jesus, of course, because that's kind of what they do. Um, and they're asking for a sign. Basically, they're saying, we want you to prove um, you are who you say you are. And Jesus um, has a great reply for him. He says, well, you, no, you, you don't get a sign. The only sign actually you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. And there he's referring to um, his death and in, in burial and resurrection. So uh, if you remember the story of Jonah, Jonah was supposed to go preach to Nineveh. He didn't. He ran away, um, ended up getting swallowed by a giant fish. Um, and then was in the belly of the fish for three days, and then got on the third day got spit up on the land, and then he went and preached to Nineveh like he was supposed to. And so Jesus is there referring to how he'll be in the grave, much like Jonah was in the fish, um, for three days, and then um, he'll rise again. And then beginning in verse 5, Jesus warns him to actually avoid, warns the disciples to avoid uh, bread from the Pharisees and Sadducees, and of course the disciples are a little confused because they're thinking, what's, what's, what's wrong with bread? We, we don't even have bread. Who got bread? Did somebody get bread? You, you can tell it's a bunch of guys, because they're, they're hungry at that point now. Somebody mentioned food, and they're like, well, somebody has food? Let's get some food. And then they, after, and Jesus says, no, 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 I'm not talking about bread, bread. I'm talking about the teachings of them, that they, te- they have false teachings. And so then, uh, not literal bread. And so then, in verse 13, actually begins kind of the transition piece of Matthew. So really, for the first um, you know, like 15 and a half chapters, Matthew has been building this case of who Jesus is. That's why he starts with the genealogy of, of Jesus' lineage and then goes through these miracles and these signs, and these teachings, and all of these things are to build the case that Jesus really is the Messiah. He really is the one that has been promised in the Old Testament to save people from their sins and to reestablish the kingdom of God on earth. And so in verse 13, as we get in this transition, he asks, who do people say I am? Which is a good way to kind of culminate things. If, if you're building a case of who Jesus is, it's, it, I mean, that makes sense to ask the question. Well, then who do you, who do you say he is at this point? And so they, when they say, well, some people say you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're just some prophet. And Jesus says, okay, but who do you say that I am? And Peter gives the golden answer. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so then uh, Jesus says, good job, right? Simon Peter, um, he says, this, on this basis, he will build the church or the gathering. And we talked about that about a month ago, that the church is actually a gathering of people um, who are called by God, and we're gathered to worship, we're gathered to celebrate, uh, but more importantly, we're gathered to actually extend heaven uh, to earth. And you say, well, how can that be? Well, as we gather and we are transformed by the gospel and as we learn to love each other as Christ loved us as we learn to serve each other as Christ served us as we learn to be generous as Christ was generous to us then we can reflect that in the outer world and we can actually go out and not just be loving and nice to ourselves but actually loving and nice to those that are not with Christ just yet and we can actually extend heaven outward and invite them to come and gather with us as well and to know Christ and so at this point you think, well, the disciples have to be ready then, right? Peter gives this wonderful answer. Jesus gives him a gold star. Everything's got to be great. In the next few chapters, this is going to be like a great, wonderful ride for how wonderful the disciples are. No, it's not how that works at all, actually, because what, we see, what we're going to see is that very quickly, uh, Peter 
who even though had the right answer, now he's about to go and have a wrong answer and have the wrong way. And so let's look in verse 21 to 20. We're just going to read 21 to 23. It says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he, tur- but he, Jesus, turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on things of man. It's kind of, I mean, it's a, the same exact chapter. I mean, only, what, a couple of verses away. Peter goes from having this understanding of who Jesus is, and, and, and like he's, okay, it's like, okay, he's got it. And then the very next couple of verses, no, he, he don't got it. And that's, I mean, that's how it is a lot of times in our Christian walk. We think, oh, I think I finally figured this out. And then something comes up and it's like, well, maybe we, maybe we don't have it worked out as well as we thought we did. And so Peter uh, chastises Jesus, which is kind of hilarious in, in one sense. Like, who is he to chastise Jesus? Uh, but Jesus says that his mission is going to go, it's going to take him to Jerusalem, right? But he's not going to go as a conquering hero. He's going to go as the suffering servant, which is a term that comes from Isaiah, actually. And he's going to go to his death and on the third day be raised alive. Now, if you look again at those verses, Jesus was very clear, right? He said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things. I'm going to be killed. And then on the third day, I'll be raised. Now, the part that really should stick out is that part about coming back from the dead. It seems like that would be the part that like, wait, I'm sorry, you said what now? Right. But what does Peter hear? Peter hears that he's going to suffer and die. And that's what he reacts to. That's, he said, no, 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 that, you, you can't do that. Like, the Messiah can't go and die. What, that's, that's not, that, that can't happen, right? Because in Peter's mind, he's thinking the Messiah is going to come and conquer everybody and kill the Romans, and it's going to be great and wonderful. Well, Peter, well, Jesus can't kill the Romans if he dies, right? And so Jesus says to him, no, you, uh, you are actually wrong there, right? He says, he turns and he says, get behind me, Satan, which seems like a really harsh response. But that's because Jesus is actually directing uh, his response at the real problem. The problem is not Peter's zeal. It's not even Peter's passion. The problem is Satan has put this attitude, this idea in Peter's head that is hindering the mission. I mean, think about it for a second. If Jesus doesn't go to Jerusalem, right, you say, well, he wouldn't suffer then and he wouldn't die. Isn't that a good thing? Well, not really, because Jesus' mission is to go and lay his life down on the cross. He is to go and die for our sins. He, he's supposed to be the sacrifice for our sins. So even though on the front end it looks like Peter's right to say, no, we must defend our teacher, we have to defend him, we can't let him die, well, if they do that, they mess up the whole mission altogether. And so J- Jesus says plainly, get behind me, Satan, Right, because your mind is on the things of your mind is not on the things of God, but on the things of man. And so even though it's Peter's reaction actually makes kind of sense when we look at it from an earthly perspective, it's completely it's completely off. So after all, right, if Jesus is the Son of God, why would the religious be, be the ones to harm? This is kind of an interesting thought to think about. Right? Peter's maybe he's upset about the idea of Jesus dying, which is you know, fairly so. But he's also upset about these religious people being the ones that are going to put him to death, because he names the, the, the elders, the scribes, etc. And you say, why would Peter be like upset with them? Well, one, they've already you know, been kind of a nuisance this whole time in Jesus' ministry. But two, their hearts are far from God, right? The, the, the religious elite are actually more concerned about the relationship with Rome and maintaining power than they are with their relationship with God. Peter falls in a category of, called, of what's called a zealot, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more, but essentially this is a guy who is trying to defend Israel and the temple of God from Roman influence and Roman people. Because the Gentiles have come in, one, they've conquered the land, so that's a problem, but two, they've constantly been trying to uh, put things in the temple that don't belong there. They've been trying to have these, these idol worships to, to infiltrate. And what's worse is some of the priests and some of the scribes have actually allowed influence in Israel because that way they can have some more comforts and they can have some more power of their own and whatnot. Herod himself, the king that we, we talked about in the past, he's only there really as a puppet king. I mean, he's, he's only there because he, he, he kisses the Roman emperor's ring. 
So Peter's reaction, it could be considered noble on the one hand, right? Even godly because he is going to defend Christ from being killed. But the point there in your bulletin, sometimes even good ideas can be satanic when they go against God's plan. Ultimately, it's not about whether or not uh, Peter should defend Jesus. It's not about whether Peter should have this passion for defending Jesus. It's not, it's not even really about the, the, the violent tendencies there, though that's probably not a good thing either. But the fact of the matter is that the mission of God is that the Christ would come, that he would teach, that he would heal, he would prove he is who he says he is, and then he would lay his life down for an atonement for our sins. And because of that, we can have forgiveness, we can have eternal life, we can have a place in heaven, but none of that happens without Christ going to the cross. And so when Peter says, no, you can't do this thing, Jesus says, uh, yes, I will, and Satan, you need to go away because you are impeding the mission at hand. <coughs> so the problem here, again, is not Peter's desire to defend Jesus. The problem is Jesus needs no defense. In fact, Jesus is going to accomplish his mission despite Peter's indignation. Ironically, Peter will actually fall away along with the other disciples when the soldiers come, but even this cowardice is actually part of God's plan. All these things that are going to happen are part of the plan for our salvation. So success for Jesus is death on the cross because through this death, he will be raised and will be forgiven. He actually he needs to go to Jerusalem because that's where he will find success. So there's a principle here that I, I don't want us to overlook before we go on. God's mission is always priority one. Sometimes God's mission doesn't seem to line up with what the world would consider good. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, you have a, a, a teacher who's doing great things. He's a miracle worker. He's healing people. He's bringing people back together, and he's, he's breaking all these kind of social norms, and, and also he's doing all sorts of wonderful things. You think, well, well, we can't stop that. Like, he needs to stick around as long as he can, right? But no, that's, no, God's mission was for him to go to the cross. Jesus must suffer and die. And that doesn't seem very good, but that's exactly what's needed. And so if we are to truly think, uh, if we, excuse me, that seems very good, and yet that is like exactly what no one needed. No one needed Peter to defend Jesus. Rather than thinking in terms of what seems good or bad, perhaps if we were to truly know God's will in a situation, we should think in terms of what will draw us closer to God. I'll read that again. Rather than thinking in terms of what seems good or bad, perhaps if we were, tr we were to truly know God's will in a situation, we should think in terms of what will draw us closer to God. So the point there in your bulletin, we can discern between a godly idea and a satanic idea by asking which option will draw me and others closer to the Lord? A lot of times we don't think in terms of drawing closer to the Lord. We think in terms of, well, this, this is good. It feels good. It must be good. Or, well, this is the easy option, so this must be good because it's easier to do. And we say, well, I can't, I can't do this thing that I might be called to do because that's, that's bad, that's uncomfortable, or, or that, 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 that's harder. And it's like, well, no, that's, that's probably the right thing to do, though. There's a, there's a book out there that the guy wrote for teenagers. It's called Do Hard Things. And the, I mean, the whole point of the book is just encouraging teenagers, and honestly, I think some adults could read it too, is to just embrace this idea of, you know, sometimes the hard thing is the right thing to do. I, I was listening to a comedian one day. He was talking. He said that for some reason people would go to him and ask for advice, which is kind of weird because it's like, why would you go to a comedian for advice? But anyway... But the lady was giving him just this kind of situation what was going on, and she said, I don't really know what to do. And he said he thought about it for a second, and he said, I'll tell you what, whichever one of those options is the most difficult for you to do, that's probably the right one. And I thought, well, that's actually not bad advice. I mean, there's a blind squirrel hitting a nut, right? Because sometimes the most difficult thing for us to do is actually the thing that we need to do. We don't want to do it. It's very uncomfortable to do it. That's why it's called difficult. But if that's the right thing to do, that's the right thing to do. There's a lot of things that we would prefer Jesus to have done, maybe, but he needed to suffer and die. Because without that, we would all be lost. So in your life, if you're thinking, like, which option should I do? Sometimes it's just, hey, which one draws us closer to God? And maybe it is the more difficult choice. Embrace the difficulty in it and go for it. We see this principle at work in a variety of circumstances today. My first thought is with uh, Christians who pick at different events, right? Whether they're picking against abortion or LGBT or whatever, 
um, it seems like they're doing the right thing, right? I mean, they're they're calling, they're raising up the cause, they're they're speaking the truth, they're they're saying this isn't right. That sounds like really good things, except are they actually drawing anybody to God, or are they just making a lot of noise? I mean, does it really do anybody any good to yell in their face and scream at them and tell them they're going to hell and da 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 da? I mean, you spoke the truth, sure, but. Are you actually drawing them closer to Christ? Are you actually drawing them into a conversation where you can share God's love? Or are we just making a lot of noise and yelling at people? It's not, it's not, and besides, Jesus doesn't really need defending. At the end of the day, he's king of kings and lord of lords. I think he can defend himself just fine. Sometimes we're like little mice running around, uh, you know, squeaking at large animals, and there's a lion behind us that we're defending. And it's like, I don't think we need to defend the lion. We're just little mice. I think the lion's, I think the lion's going to be okay. You see, uh, we saw in Scripture, we'll see it throughout the Bible, Jesus needs no defender. And yes, we should contend for the faith. I'm not saying you shouldn't engage in these conversations, but our contending should be for the purpose of drawing people to Christ. If we're not persuading others to Christ, then we're not contending for the faith. We're just being contentious. And there is a difference between those two. I've also seen this principle at work in churches, right, when they debate over programs or music, right? One party believes they're defending the cause of Christ. The other party says they're defending the cause of Christ. And whenever churches are driven in opposing directions like that, they're not really drawing anybody to Christ. They're just arguing amongst themselves, and they're driving themselves apart. And so there are times when opposing opinions will emerge in church. That's, that's just part of life. People have different opinions. Sometimes they conflict with another. But rather than asking, how can I fight the opposition or how can I get my way, a better question is, how can we resolve this conflict while drawing each side closer to Christ? If we are the church of God and we're to be united together, then how can we maintain unity and draw each other towards unity? And interestingly, Jesus actually answers this question in the very next verse. So let's read 24 to 28. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So if we're to draw closer to Christ, we must be willing to put to death our old way of life and old way of thinking. If we're to follow Christ, we have to put to death the old way of doing things. There's a bit of a wordplay here that doesn't really appear in English. The word for life and soul that Jesus uses, it's actually the same Greek word, it's, it's psyche, uh, which is, yes, where we get like psychology and other words like that. Um, there are four words that can be translated life. I'll put them up on the screen. For those of y'all that like to take notes, I put them on the screen. For those of you who are like, uh, not a Greek lesson, it's okay. There's a point to it, just, so just hang on for a second, right? But there's four different words, and they're used in the Bible, that deal with kind of life, right? So there's helikia, which is just lifespan. So like however long somebody lives, that's their helikia. There's uh, bios, which is where we get our root for biology and that sort of thing. Um, and that's just physical life, right? So plants have a bios, humans have a bios, animals have a bios. Everything, you know, everything that's living has a bios. And then there's zoe, which is, yes, yeah, where we get the name zoe. Um, and it, it has to do with eternal life or heavenly life. Um, whenever Jesus uses this word, it has to do with um, entering heaven or having that eternal life of heaven, that sort of thing. Um, consequently, it also doesn't just start after you, you physically die, but it can start now, but we'll get back to that. Um, and then psyche, which is the one here, it's inner being or way of life. Um, a one word definition might be even identity. So who are you? Right when we when we peel off all the layers, right we take out all the extra stuff. Like who are you at your at your core, right? People know might know you at different ways. Uh, you know they might know you by your job. They might know you by oh you're so and so's dad or you're so and so's mom. Um, growing up forever, I was Jason's younger brother um, or Eric's younger brother. I was never Justin. I was always Jason or Eric's younger brother, which was kind of annoying. Um, or worse, I was Randy's kid. Um, it's like really. Like, I have a name, right? But you know how that is. I mean, you're just, you're known as that person. Ironically, I was called Jason, even into adulthood, by people who never met my brother. But anyway, it's just kind of one of those weird things. 
uh, might know you by your job, right? Like who are, are you, like some people say, well, I'm, I'm a farmer. That's who I am. That's, I farm. That's, most of y'all know me. You're like, well, you're the pastor. And I'm like, well, there's, I'm like an onion. There are layers. And you're like, no, 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 you're the pastor. That's how we know you. That's, that's who you are. It's like, but there's more to me, right? Uh, but whatever it is. And, but it all calls to be translated soul because when we think about who we are as a being, right? If you, if you cut off my hand, I'm still Justin. You know, and as you take away more and more body parts, one, I'll be dead, but I'll still be me. I'll still have, you know, my soul of who I am. And that's what this word psyche has to do with is, is this soul or this inner life, this, this lifestyle even. And so when we look at uh, back in 2024 20, where he says, if anyone would come after me, right, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever will try to hold on and save their identity, their inner self, and who they think they are, you will eventually lose that actually. Right, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The, the great irony, kind of a paradox of the Christian life is the more we try to hold tight to who we are and who we think we are and defend that, the quicker we'll actually lose that and it'll go away. But if we're willing to just offer it up to Christ and say, you have my whole being, everything, here it is, we actually will save it. And even more so, we'll know how God designed us to be. And we'll be able to live at the way that God purposed us to be as a human being, which is far better than anything we could come up with for ourselves. And that's what's going on here. That's the, the word play there, that we're saving the soul. So it's far more than just a physical life for a person, right? If Jesus meant, well, you just have to lay down your physical life, he would have used bios, and, and that would have been that. If it just meant for the time that we're on earth, some people think, well, I just got to do what I can while I'm alive, and then when I get to heaven, then like the real fun will start. But that's, that would be Hilakia. That's not really what he's saying here, right? And we don't have to wait till we're dead to make the decision to follow Christ. So it's not really finding or losing our Zoe. It's not about that once heaven comes, then eternal life starts, or it's not about once I'm dead, then eternal life starts. No, eternal life actually starts now, on earth when we surrender to christ we receive eternal life that day and so our life continues on even though when we lay this body down our life continues on yes we enter zoe we enter into eternal life but the physic the psyche part of it the inner soul of us is transformed today so jesus is telling us that if we're to truly follow him we must be willing to lose everything that makes us who we are and that's the scary part when you read in the Gospels where it talks about crowds and crowds of people following Jesus, and then Jesus will make a statement or he'll teach something, and then all of a sudden the crowds start dispersing away, I think it's about the point where he talks about this kind of thing. Because anytime uh, a preacher or anybody talks about how great God is and the blessings that come from God and all the great things that happen when you follow Jesus and heaven and that sort of thing, Everybody's on board with that. I mean, who wants to go to heaven? Well, everybody wants to go to heaven. That's, that's a no-brainer, right? But then when you get to the part of, okay, but following Jesus means you have to give up your whole self. You have to be willing to sacrifice anything and everything that you think is about you so that way you can receive from God what is actually truly you. Well, that's where it gets hard. Because what if, what if my family is part of my identity and, 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 and the ties that I have with that and the roots that I have with that? You, you want me to break away from my family? You want me to denounce my mother and father? Well, that's actually what Jesus meant about hating mother and father. It's not that you despise them or that you just are cruel to them. It just means that the kingdom of heaven is more important than your family connections. Now, again, ironically, when you give that to Christ, he calls you to do things like go tell your family about Christ. And then, in, and then when you're restored, when they follow Christ too, then you're all together anyway. If you say, well, I can't, I can't give up my job. What if God calls me to be like a missionary in China or something? I don't, I don't want to do that. I might, I might have to like go meet weird people and they have weird foods and I got to do all that. I like, I like being American. I'm American. Okay, but what if, what if going to China is actually the greatest experience you'll ever have in your life? Because it's actually who you are more than what you think of now. It doesn't have to be China anywhere. Down the road might even be. 
You say, I can't talk to those people. Those people live on that side of town. They live on that side of, of whatever. My people live over here. Those people live over there. I can't, I, can't be, I can't be intermingling with them. And God says, no, you actually need to because they need to hear about Christ too. You say, but I can't do it. That's not who I am. That's not my identity. I'm not, a, I'm not an evangelist. I'm not one of those weird Jesus thumpers. Well, if you sacrifice that idea and you give it back to him, what you find is that you have the greatest story ever. And it's so great, it's even true. And that you can share heaven and eternity with God with other people. What greater joy is there than to share Christ with somebody, have them receive Christ, and they're thanking you because you took the time to share Christ with them. I'll go ahead and tell you, there's no greater joy. That is such a phenomenal feeling when you're talking with somebody and they're listening and they're wanting to follow Jesus. It's an amazing feeling. But you can't experience that if you're, if you're not willing to say, you know what, Lord, here it is. Take it. Have fun. If we're to truly follow Jesus, we must be willing to sacrifice our whole identity and even lifestyle in order to discover our true purpose and design. And you say, well, does that mean I got to sell everything? I got to give everything up? I got I to live like a homeless person or something? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know what God's calling you to do. But I know you'll never know and experience the joy of following God if you're not willing to do something. So at this point, if you think about Peter, Peter's known as a zealot. He's a, a warrior for the temple of God. He's identified himself with those who would overthrow Roman rule if given an opportunity. We use that word zeal in English uh, a little too lazily. Right? We, we, people get zealous about sports or whatever. They're, they're very zealous. They're very zealous people. Okay, are they willing to like kill others for their cause? That's what a zealot is. It's somebody who's willing to go to battle um, for this cause. So when Peter is identified as a zealot, he's not just really excited about the temple. He's not just really hateful of Romans. He's willing to kill. You could almost say terrorist. I mean, the, if we look at what the zealots did in those first century in the, in the B.C., it's, it's not unlike terrorism. And so when Jesus says, you know, or when Peter says to Jesus, far be it, this will never happen to you, he's not saying, hey, we're going to avoid Jerusalem because we want to keep you safe. What he's saying is, I will kill anybody that comes and harms you. I will take them out. And this promise actually is almost fulfilled if you think about it because what, what happens when the soldiers come to get Jesus? Peter whips out his sword and cuts off the dude's ear. The dude's kind of lucky at that point if you think about it because all he lost was an ear. Right? And then we know the story. Jesus picks up the ear, puts it back on his head like Mr. Potato Head, and then, you know, and then his ear's fine. But that is the type of, of identity that Peter has. He's saying, I am not going to let this happen. Jesus telling Peter that Peter must get rid of this violent identity. If Peter is to truly follow Jesus, Peter must deny himself the righteous indignation. Their cause actually was fairly just, if you think about it. They have Roman oppressors that are overtaxing them. They're a burden to them. Israel at this point is a very impoverished um, area, very impoverished country, and partly to do with the overtaxation and, the, and the, deal, the problems that they've been dealing with. But Peter's to deny the impulse to defend his homeland, deny his identity as a zealot, right? That old life must be put to death. That's why he says, take up thy cross. We would say today, like, take up your uh, syringe filled with lethal injection, or take up your... Uh, electric chair and you say well that's kind of weird why would you why would you carry around an electric chair why would you carry around a cross it's a tool for executing criminals what jesus is saying here is put to death all of that repentance is not just okay i'll try not to do that again repentance is i'm going to put that old self to death so that i can embrace this new life that christ offers and so if we are to truly follow jesus again we must be willing to sacrifice our whole identity and lifestyle in order to discover our true purpose and design. <clears throat> Jesus then quickly addresses two main arguments people have against this idea of self-denial. The first is worldly gain, right? Many will say, I can't get rid of who I am because it's tied to my livelihood. How is a person to make it in this world if they're going to be one of those Jesus people? Right? Jesus replies, what does it profit to gain the whole world but lose your soul? Right? What does it matter if you have all the riches of this world but you spend eternity in hell? What does it matter if you're the richest, most powerful, most popular, most whatever, if you lo lose the soul of who you are? There have been a number of people who uh, have, have denounced their popularity or their celebrity or their riches or whatever because they realized they were losing who they were as a person. 
It's actually one of the great tragedies in Hollywood. They have these little child stars. Have you ever looked up where are they now kind of articles? Like kids that grew up in the industry? Most of them, have, I mean, it's, it's horrible and it's sad because they've basically lost their soul and they're not even, they're not even remotely like what they used to be. And I don't mean because they got old. I mean because they got messed up because of the abuses and all sorts of stuff that happened. This warning, though, it's not just for the rich, right? In 21st century America, we enjoy a level of comfort and luxury. It was undreamt of in previous century. So if you're ever really feeling down on yourself because you, you're having problems paying a bill or something, just remember we live at the most luxurious time in human history. Some of y'all walked in and you were like, ooh, it's, it's chilly in here. And I, and I got to turn up the heater. And now most of y'all are like, all right, I feel a little bit better. Or if you're like me, you're like, okay, it's getting warm. Can you turn it back down now? Right? That was unheard of hundreds of years ago. Or in the summer, especially the summer, you come in, it's blazing hot outside, and you're all sweaty and nasty and whatnot. Right? But then you come in the room, and you're like, ooh, it's nice and cool. It must be magic. No, it's air conditioner. Right? Something that didn't exist 200 years ago. And now, it's, I mean, it's amazing what we can do. Your pews have cushions. For those of y'all that are like, this is uncomfortable. Hey, Puritan days, it was all wood. And, I, and I'm convinced they didn't even like sand it. It was just splintered wood to make sure you would move around in your seat and feel the guilt of your sin poking your hiney, right? We're so comfortable these days. But unfortunately, with all the production, all the technology, all the comfort, sometimes you got to ask yourself, what have we lost in all that? We got all these devices that we can connect. I can, I can talk to somebody a whole world away instantaneously. That's amazing. And yet I struggle to talk to my kids sometimes because I'm too busy playing something or whatever. We, we visited my family this week and all my kids, of course, doing this number. And I'm like, ugh, it's annoying. But then I let them do it, so it's my fault, right? My uncle comes in. and My uncle, he's a weird guy anyway, but anyway. Uh, but he's just like, oh, look at that. They're, they're on their devices. Let's, they, can't, they can't even talk to anybody no more. And I'm like, well, I think you kind of scare them is why I don't want to talk to you. But, yeah, I get your point, right? But we, we've lost the soul of what it means to be human because we, we struggle with having relationships with one another and actually talking with one another and sharing life with one another because we've built up all these layers of barricades and we just call it productivity or technology or whatever. Sometimes it feels like we might be losing what makes us human because many are losing their soul in favor of some artificial life that is unsustainable. One of the greatest choices I ever made was to get off social media and not deal with the comparison things because, I mean, it's all fake anyway. I mean, when, when, I, when I look at somebody's profile and they're like, look at how wonderful life is. I'm like, I know you. Your, your life is not that great. But that's just how it is. Second argument is related to seeking justice or revenge, right? How can I follow Jesus in peace and forgiveness when so many have hurt me or some oppressive system is bearing down on me? I'm sure Peter had a lot to say about those puppet religious leaders and the Roman overlords. Jesus, don't you know they overtax the poor? Don't you know they try to establish idols in the Lord's temple? Haven't you seen them attack families? Of course, you know if you know the story of Christ and his birth, um, I mean, this is, this is the same government that went and killed all the newborns because Herod was afraid of the king that was to be born. So yeah, Jesus knew these things. And Jesus replies, when the Son of Man returns with his angels, there will be a great retribution for all the people, for all that people have done. So do not be overly concerned about justice or breaking oppression when it is more important to follow Christ. Prepare your own soul for the Son of Man's return, then you can help others prepare for their, their, prepare their own soul. As Christians, sometimes we become overly concerned about social issues, and there is a, certainly a time and place for those discussions, but I'll return to my earlier point. In our concern for justice, we cannot lose sight of what people need the most. They need Jesus. There will be no racial reconciliation until people have Jesus. There will be no peace in the Middle East until they have Jesus. There will be no peace in the U.S. between political parties until they have Jesus. There will no be peace anywhere until people have Jesus. The first step is not to get on Facebook or some other platform and yell and scream about the injustice of the world. The first step is to go to your neighbor and say, Have you heard about my Savior? Do you know Christ? I'd love to introduce you. The point there, following Jesus means denying what you think you deserve in favor of what God calls you towards. This is part of what it means to deny yourself. 
deny your self-righteousness, deny your uh, desire for vengeance or desire for justice, deny all those things in, in favor of what God calls you towards. Deal with what God calls you to deal with and let him deal with everything else. Last, I know we're running out of time, but I, I want to tackle one last thing. Matthew 16, 28. This is a verse that has plagued Bible readers for centuries. Some of you, if you read it for the first or first time or so, you probably read it and said, wait a minute, what did he say there? Uh, theologians have offered several different interpretations, some better than others. And the problem appears, if you look at 28 again, it says, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man come in his kingdom. And what it sounds like is that Jesus is saying that the Son of Man is going to return before those disciples die. Well, those disciples are dead now, so it's like, how does that work out? And so what ends up happening is people say, well, there mu it must be some kind of mistake, which is fine, except then that calls into question the whole infallibility of the Bible thing, right? Because if, if Jesus made a mistake here, then Jesus isn't prone to making mistakes. So how do you, know, how do you reconcile that? And so I wanted, I wanted to show you these verses in parallel. So Mark 9, 1, this is how Mark records it. He says, and he said to them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And then Luke 9, 27, but I tell you truly there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And so the statement's a little bit different in each one. Matthew's the only one that's like kind of kind of like making you go, wait, hang on, what a second. Um, and just for further illustration in John 21, 21 through 23, John records when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Uh, this is actually just for context. Jesus has just told Peter he's going to die. And so Peter's kind of like, wait a minute, what? And uh, being a dude, Peter points at John and says, well, what about this guy? Like, let's, let's talk about how he's going to die. And Jesus says to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Right. So John, the reason I pull out that John verse is because there's a lot of times where Jesus says things and people are confused about it. Right, which makes sense. I mean, how many of y'all have read the Bible? You're looking at the gospel, you read it, and you're going, I don't get that. That's confusing. It, it happens, right? And so John here actually is clarifying um, what's being said, but it is related to these other verses here too. What does Jesus mean by this? Um, in each of the synoptics, it, Jesus makes a statement just prior to the transfiguration. In, ne in the very next chapter, when we look at next week, Jesus is going to go on to the mount, and he's actually going to be transformed. They're going to see... Peter, James, and John are going to go with him, and they're going to see Jesus in a glorified state. And they're actually going to see Moses and Elijah as well. And so part of, uh, the most probable answer is that he's referring to the transfiguration. right? When medieval scribes broke the Bible into chapters and verses, if you look at these, uh, these uh, verses, you can look at them later, notice they put the statement at the beginning of Mark's chapter, they put it at the end of Matthew's chapter, and then in Luke's, it's actually kind of in the middle, sandwiched by teachings and stories related to the idea of denying oneself to follow Jesus in kingdom work. And so all, when the scribes were breaking apart chapters and verses, they recognized that this is, this is a very important point, but it's also a, a transition point. And so they broke it up in different ways. But what we're seeing is that the, Jesus is saying, hey, th some of you aren't even going to die before you see the kingdom. And we know with Peter, James, and John, they see Jesus transfigured. They, we know with John, he sees heaven, and, and that becomes revelation. When you read Revelation, the re reason it looks so weird is because John is having a heavenly vision. Right? Second, notice how each gospel writer phrases a statement. Matthew leans towards a second coming kind of phrasing. Mark's a bit more general. He just states the kingdom of God is coming in power. Luke is even more general. It's just they'll see the kingdom of God. And so theologians have argued that seeing Matthew as a second coming reference is actually the mistake because when you compare it with the other two, it may just mean that they're, they just mean the same thing, is the kingdom of God coming in power. And even though it seems a little weak, when you couple this occurrence with the transfiguration up after each instance, it actually does kind of start to make a little bit more sense. So one option is simply that Jesus is referring to the transfiguration. Um, the other one has to do with our understanding of the word see, um, just they understand it. So maybe not that they see, like visibly see it or physically see it, but they're seeing, like they're understanding it's coming, which kind of leads to maybe Pentecost and things like that. Um, there's some other problems with that one, but the short version of all that, since it's noon, is Jesus is most probably referring to the transfiguration in Matthew 16:28. Now, 
This theological rabbit hole, though, is not just for kicks. So those of y'all packing up because you think I'm done, I hang on a second because you're going to miss the most important point. There is an important point here we overlook if we just lose sight of the forest for the trees. And Jesus tells the disciples, some of them won't have to die in order to see and experience the kingdom of God. All right, wrap your head around that for a second. Because for many Christians, we talk about, well, there's earth, we do the best we can, we leave it in God's hands, and then when we die, we get to go to heaven, and then we get to see heaven. And then we get to see the kingdom of God and all that stuff. Well, there is a very big problem with that viewpoint. It's not biblical. Because Jesus is actually very clear here. Some of them, they're not actually going to die before they see the kingdom of heaven. We know Peter, James, and John will see the kingdom with uh, Elijah and Moses. We know the other disciples, except for Judas, they're going to experience the power of the kingdom at Pentecost. We know John's also going to see the kingdom in his vision that's recorded in Revelation, uh, which is actually another option, but that's a really weak one. But the point is simply this. It is possible to experience the kingdom of God before dying. And I don't know if anybody's ever told you that. If you are a Christian, it is possible to experience the kingdom of God before you die. You actually, when you become a Christian, you already get a glimpse of it. I mean, that's what becoming a Christian is. I'm turning from my old ways, I'm turning to my new ways, but much more than a behavior thing, it's a spiritual thing. There is a transformation. The Holy Spirit enters you and, and, and it reforms your heart, and reforms your mind. And the closer you walk with Jesus, the more you experience that power the more you experience the kingdom of God. And there have been throughout church history instances where people had ecstatic visions or whatever else. And you say, well, why doesn't that happen now, though? Why don't, why don't I experience those things? Is it, is it because like God's working differently? Am I, am I just not as, as cool as those guys, or am I not as loved as those guys? And I say, no, that's not it at all. I think the question to ask is if we don't have similar experiences or we don't see our prayers answered in powerful ways, maybe we need to ask, are we doing the same things as those disciples? How can I expect to have my prayer answered in a supernatural way if I don't take the time to pray in the first place? How can I expect to see God's work in my life and to know the kingdom of God at work when, when it's happening if I never actually crack open my Bible and read what that looks like and what, that, what God can do. The question we really have to ask ourselves is how are we living that might be inhibiting us seeing the kingdom of God? So, I mean, it gets back to the whole technology thing. We're so driven with our screens, we don't even talk to our neighbors. And yet, do we blame our neighbors for that? I mean, I got weird neighbors, they never talk to me. Well, how often do you get out of your house? You know? I mean, that's just, it's, it's, we can think about it outside of us, but maybe it's probably more important to think of us inside of us. That we're just not doing the things that would help us to see these ways. All right, I had a classmate that was on this topic a long time ago. I don't even remember the guy's name, but I'll never forget what he said. He said, instead of worrying about why we can't accomplish what those guys accomplished, talking about the disciples, maybe we should worry about what we're doing we should worry about doing what those guys did, right? Paul was such a marvelous missionary, amazing missionary, right? Probably the, the archetype, best missionary ever. And you say, well, how can I reach people with Christ like Paul did? Well, are you living like Paul did? You say, well, I, so-and-so, they're such a great evangelist. They're, they're so e it's so easy for them to talk about Jesus with their friends and family and the weird guy at the gas station. Like, I don't see how he does it. Well, are you, are you trying are you taking the time to talk to them? You can't share Jesus if you don't open up your mouth and try, right? I, don't, I can't believe so-and-so, they're able to just give so sacrificially. How can they just give like that? Don't they worry about money? Don't they worry? Have, have you tried? Have you tried just, I mean, just hand some money, gloves, whatever? Sometimes it's not about maybe what God's doing or not doing. It's about what we're doing or not doing. That's the problem. So as we consider what it means to follow Christ today, let's just take a moment. Stop worrying about the cost or whether we'll see the same effects, right? Because it's, I mean, that's not even really the goal is to, to duplicate everything that they did. The goal is to follow Christ and do what he calls us to do.
So ask yourself these questions. And they're on, on the back of your bulletin, there's actually, I've written them down here because this is how I want us to kind of reflect as we move into the invitation. Is my comfort or wealth more important than my soul? Right? Think, what good will your money and, and bark allowed you do in eternity? Is revenge or being right more important than the kingdom of God? What good does it do to win an argument if it drives people away from Jesus? Last, if you've struggled to experience the God at work in your life, ask yourself, have I tried doing the same things the disciples did? I mean, they walked with him, they talked with him for three years. And you say, well, Jesus isn't walking on earth, maybe not, but he's in your heart. If you're a Christian, you have the same spirit in your heart that he, that was the same spirit that raised him from the dead. The same spirit that, that he walked and talked and shared and loved and, and, and healed. Maybe just take some time each day to actually walk with him and talk with him. Have you turned away from the sinful lifestyle that defined you in the past? This is, this is a hard one for most people. I, I told a kid one time, following Jesus is easy. It's getting rid of your sin that's the hard part because we, we like it so much. It's so easy. It's so comfortable. But we got to get rid of it. And the sooner you get rid of it, the sooner you'll be able to actually do things that God has called you to do. Instead of wasting time with your sin, you can spend that time with Christ. Have you given up a job, a family member, a friend, or some other part of your identity in order to follow Jesus? Jesus me like, well, I'm, I'm kind of getting old. I don't know if I can just give up everything. I'll, you know, I'm really set in my ways. Moses was 80 when he started, so, I mean, there you go. And, I'm, and again, whether or not you are to literally give up everything, that's between you and God. But if you're not willing to at least say, Lord, here it is, I lay it at your feet, You've missed the first step altogether. And you'll never grow into what God has called you to do if you don't at least just say, Lord, here it is. I'm scared to death, but here it is. Do you walk daily with him? Have you prayed and listened for his response? Have you read and studied the Bible, which is actually God's word? It's his primary way of speaking to us. And last, are you known for following Jesus or for something else? When you think about your identity and who you are as a person, as a, uh, as a creation of God, do other people look at you and say, you know what, that person follows Jesus. They may not necessarily agree with you, but they may not even like it, but they know where you stand. Are you known for that or for something else? As we close today, I want to read 16, 24 to 25 one more time. I'm going to read it, and I'll close this with prayer, and then Carolyn's going to come and give the invitation. It's just a time to respond to what God is calling you to. If you have any questions or anything, I'd be down front. I'd um, love to talk with you. If you want to join the church, that'd be a good time to do it too. But let's read 16, 24, 25 one more time, and then let's close in prayer. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Father, we pray again for understanding and wisdom as we step into this new year. Lord, for those that have been following you for a long time, I ask you to encourage us and embolden us to to take further steps of faith. Whatever that may be, we may not know, but we ask you to tell us what that is. And give us the strength to follow in those steps. And Lord, even when we think we don't have the strength to do it, help us do it anyway. Lord, if there's some here who have not yet followed you and they're not really sure what it means Help them to understand at least this one point that we can't keep doing the same things we've been doing for years and years and expect different results. That if we want to hear from you, we need to pray and listen. If we want to walk with you, we've got to get up and walk. Lord, that if we want to experience the love that you have, we have to know you. And so, Lord, I ask you to help them today to take a step of faith to to learn what it means to follow and know their Lord and Savior. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.